outside. It feels quite warm in here, doesn't it? Isn't it great that the heating is fixed? <laughs> it's brilliant. No, I'm delighted about that. Genuinely, it's really good. But no, welcome. It is, it's, I think we're proper eight, Trinity four. We're working our way through green and it's great. Is my uh, mic working? Can I just check? Yeah. Good, excellent, that's right. So it's interesting today. The subject is the contrast of a very high important VIP in a community and Jesus is rating of that person in relating to somebody who's very low in the community. And we'll talk more about that later. But for now, let's just begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. So, once again I remind you we cannot sing, so please do sit down. And we will have hymn number 522. We cannot measure how you heal. Verses 1 and 2, so it's number 522. Two. say the prayer on page four of the Greek book. And so we pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments, and to live in love and peace with all. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, Forgive us all that is past, 
and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, for our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Would you like to sit for our Amen. Did not have too much, 
and the one that had little did not have too little. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Would you remain seated and the choir will sing for us hymn number 520, number 520, thine arm, O Lord, was strong to heal and save. And we're looking at verses 1 and 2. Would you like to stand? <coughs> Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the lake. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? He looked all round to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. 
when he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do please be seated. What an extraordinary story. Two stories in one. It's the most unbelievable thing. A girl and a woman. One, a little girl on her deathbed with a very powerful father to support her. The other, an impoverished woman whose long illness has pushed her right to the edges of society. And what links them? Jesus. Jesus, the healer and the restorer and the scandalous unclean boundary crosser. So the story begins on the beach and Jesus and the disciples have just literally stepped out when Jairus, this leader, important man, a VIP of the day, pushes through the crowd and begs Jesus, come and help my 12 year old daughter. And of course, Jesus has compassion and agrees. And he and Jairus make their way to the house. But as they go there, a woman comes out of the crowd. She pushes her way and stretches her hand out and is furtive about touching Jesus' cloak. She's not public about it. She's trying to keep it quiet. And immediately her bleeding stops and she knows she's healed. And at the same instant, Jesus, it always amazes me, all powerful and yet all sensitive, knows that power has gone out of him. He recognises it. And he turns to the crowd pressing in and says, who touched me? Which is a ridiculous question, because there's a huge crowd round him. What's going on? If we just press pause on the story at that point, and consider first, what is Jairus feeling? I don't know if you saw, it was actually on the newspaper front pages again today, I saw it on the BBC News app. This story in Mexico of these twin sisters who were on holiday, went off to Mexico, went swimming in a lagoon, which they were told was quite safe, and were attacked by a crocodile, a big crocodile, and it was really nasty and very difficult. And one of them was literally being eaten, I guess, by the crocodile. And the other twin sister, instead of just running or swimming away as fast as possible, she had that family love that we have so strong that she actually attacked the crocodile and started beating it on the nose so many times that it gave up and swam off. And she saved her sister's life. The most extraordinary story. But that, I think, is a perfect illustration. If we have close friends, if we have children, if we have family members who are ill, we feel so strongly, we want to stop the suffering, do everything we can. That feeling is what Jairus is feeling during this story. It's the most extraordinary thing. And I suppose from a personal level, as a father of two children who are clearly not listening so I can talk about them. Oh no, one of them is. <laughs> I totally understand his desperation and his relief and gratitude that Jesus agrees to help. And I can visualise the way he shoves and pushes out of his desperation to get to Jesus and to say to Jesus, please hurry, come, I need you now. But then I can get a sense of that frenzy boiling up in him when for no obvious reason, on the way to heal his daughter, Jesus stops and starts talking to people. What do I feel? What did Jairus feel? Please, can we get on with it? You know, just one thing at once. That's what I would have said. No, Jesus isn't like that. He's got a point to make and it's very important. And he says this bizarre question, who touched my clothes? 
And Jairus has to learn to wait when waiting is the last thing on earth he wants to do. And he learns to wait and to trust and to hang on even at the moment when all seems lost and when Jesus makes no sense to him at all. Well, let's just fast forward a few minutes from that in the story. Once the interruption of the bleeding woman is over, Jairus and Jesus keep going. They go on to the house. And Jairus has to learn again another kind of faith, the faith to keep walking in the shadow of death just because Jesus tells him to. And the faith that endures past the worst news a parent could possibly hear, the girl has died. And the faith that trusts an impossible word from God, which sounds another ridiculous word. She's not dead, but sleeping. Okay, let's pause and consider this woman, this poor woman who's been bleeding for 12 years with this condition that renders her, in her culture, ritually unclean. She is not allowed to enter the synagogue, the heart and soul of her community. She can't be touched by anybody, and she's not allowed to touch anybody else without rendering them unclean, too. So by the time she approaches Jesus, she spent everything on doctors, and her bleeding has just got worse, and her body's become a source of disgrace, and she's an outcast. The absolute lowest of the low in her culture. So for her, approaching Jesus is also desperate. She knows she should not be polluting the crowds with her presence. She's forbidden to touch people. She knows that even her fingertips touching Jesus defile him and render him unclean. But she touches him anyway. And she is healed. But Jesus invites even more than that. He insists that the woman comes forward and tells her story. She knows she's had 12 years suffering pain and prejudice and being denied spiritual nourishment. She needs somebody to listen and understand and bless her in front of the community. And that is what Jesus does, even when time is of the essence and he has essential work to do elsewhere. He pauses to restore this broken woman to fellowship and dignity and humanity. Wow. That is critical. Because by doing that, Jesus is saying loudly and clearly that she is no less important than the synagogue leader. Each of these two stories is beautiful and profound. There are two people going through physical cultural and religious barriers to meet <coughs> Jesus. So why does St Mark deliberately link these two stories together? Why does he make this thing called a Mark and Sandwich where he starts a story, breaks off, does another story and comes back at the end? Well, is the point, maybe it is the point, maybe it's not, that Jairus, this religious insider, what do you think he experiences as he watches Jesus embrace and empower an unclean woman who is a religious outsider? What's going through Jairus' head? I wonder, does he recognise his own role as an enforcer of the synagogue's taboos in the woman's isolation and suffering? Does he recognise he is guilty of that? Does he see a levelling, maybe a reordering, of who is in and who is out in God's economy? Does he flinch when he sees the woman touch Jesus and make Jesus unclean? And then rethink and have to reprocess the fact that Jesus is unconcerned with his own purity and carries on straight to Jairus' house, which the rules say he shouldn't do. Does Jairus learn something about the danger of religious taboos? Does he learn something about the importance of women's voices in his culture? Does he learn something about healing and compassion and its importance? I hope that when Jairus embraced his resurrected daughter, that he also embraced a new vision of who God is and what God values. So in Jairus' story, Jesus is te he's teaching us not to see death 
where he sees life. In the Bleeding Woman story, he teaches us that legalism gives way to love every time. And in the two stories together, Jesus restores a lost child of God, embraces what is impure to practice mercy, and he is the giver of new life. Wow, what a story. And what about us? How does it affect us? What's asleep in us that maybe needs to awaken? Or what do we have to push through in order to find God's boundless compassion? Are there hierarchies and taboos and doubts which stand in our way? These are ever-living questions. They are questions for us now. So may we ask them and face them and live them as we grow in our faith. stand to say the creed on page seven of the green book. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit, and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Would you please be seated for our prayer? Archbishop Stephen and Bishop Paul, 
We pray especially for our parish in Stokes and Seymour. We ask for your strength and guidance for Reverend Ben as he leads and teaches us. We ask for your blessing on the work as we seek to create a church community that welcomes visitors and strangers and provides a refuge for those who feel threatened and alone. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Loving God, as we see the brokenness of your world, we pray for healing among the nations. For fair distribution of coronavirus vaccines, for food where there is hunger, for freedom where there is oppression, for joy where there is pain, that your love may bring peace to all. We pray that the leaders of all nations will work together to meet the challenges facing our world. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, we pray for those who we love, family, friends, and neighbours. We pray for them in all their situations, in their hopes, their problems, and their joys. But most of all, we thank them for being what they mean to us. The society we live in seeks instant gratification for all its needs and wants. Please God, guide us to exercise patience. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Merciful God, today's gospel showed the tremendous faith of a sick woman. Help us to learn from this, that she would should always believe and not give up. We pray for all those we know who need the touch of Jesus' hand and receive healing in their lives. In moments of silence, can we think of the people we know who are suffering in mind, body, and spirit, and hope that you will surround them with your love? In our church, we especially think of Jean, Ian, Sue, Mary, Anne, Kev, Danny, Tom, Pauline, Doris, Neil, Mike, Ruth, Pauline, and Frieda. God, in your caring hands we commit those who have died and pray for those who are mourning the loss of loved ones. This morning we pray and remember the life of Peter starting. Lord, in your mercy. Hear me. We pray for all those impacted by the building collapse in Florida. We also pray that we have fair play in sport and that it can continue without having adverse effects on our efforts to conquer coronavirus throughout the world. That athletes can continue safely with the exacting task of preparing for the forthcoming Olympic Games. May they make themselves and their countries proud. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Gracious God, we have laid before you our concerns. And now we offer you our thanks and praise for all the blessings and gifts that you have given us. In the weeks ahead, help us to keep the faith as deeply and as passionately as Jairus and the woman in the lake. Merciful Father, accept these prayers the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I think the England football team are going to need more than prayer. <laughs> we shall see. The Lions looks quite interesting as well. Shall we stand to say the peace? We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit we were all baptised into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us share some kind of peace.
saying, just the power of touch is extraordinary, isn't it? Have you missed it? Yeah. Have you found yourself walking up to people holding a hand out? I have. I can't wait. It won't be long now, hopefully, God willing, <laughs> that we will be able to shake hands and hug. Won't it be great? Anyway, for now, uh, I have to invite you to sit down again as we listen to hymn number 512. Number 512. Christ is the world in which we move. 512. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood. Who, in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. 
This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of your kingdom, and with this bread and this cup, we make the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Lord. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Accept through him, our great High Priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise, and as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your Spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread.
Eternal God, comfort of the afflicted and healer of the broken, you have fed us at the table of life and hope. Teach us the ways of gentleness and peace, that all the world may acknowledge the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so we say together the prayer on page 13. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Can I invite anybody up who wants to say a notice? I know there are two. Are you going to mention changing services? Uh, why don't you come and mention it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about I get bored of my own voice sometimes. I think it's nice to hear other voices. Uh, we have a, a slight change of services starting in July. Um, we will still retain this 9.30 service, which will be filmed. David does it wonderfully. I think he's keen for somebody else to uh, take turns on our week with him if anybody's willing. Uh, and it will be streamed out on Facebook and on our website. Uh, Wednesday morning, the 9.30 service will resume on July the 7th. Um, because of that, that made us think about what to do about the plan of prayer that we've been doing from 11 to 1. I've contacted the people who come regularly to private prayer and they still would appreciate some time to have. And obviously church is not open all week like it used to be, so we can't just call in when they like. So we've decided till September to run the service at 9.30, which will be in here. The chapel is obviously too small for COVID regulations. And then from 11 to 12, we'll do one hour of private prayer. I have sent an email to those people who've helped to steward it to see if they would you know, continue and just do the hour. Thank you. Um, I received a letter this week, a very long letter, uh, from two ladies who came to the last coffee morning. Um, and they'd come all the way from Leeds, and they'd had such a great time that they found my address and wrote to thank um, all of you who helped. So I just wanted to, I won't read the whole letter, because <laughs> it might be here until lunchtime, <laughs> but, so, but they say, please share our thanks with all the saints who were ministering to all the customers at the coffee morning. We were blessed indeed by their labour of love. So, Oh well, that's not quite everything, there's one or two other. Basically, don't forget the garden party on the 25th of July. Very much on, very much looking forward to it. Very much hoping the weather will be a bit better than this sort of muggy thing going on at the moment. I can't see the mountain out of my house at the moment. I haven't seen it for about three days. Uh, other than that, most of the things are on the pew sheet, if you haven't got one. Uh, the World Day of Prayer on, is uh, coming up, so do have a look for the information about that. And there's coffee morning dates, open garden, all the rest of it. Uh, catch up with that later. But for now, let us listen to the choir sing our final hymn, which is number 806. It's number 806, there's a wideness in God's mercy. We're looking at verses 1, 2, and 4.
And so would you like to stand for our blessing? May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.